So let's get started. Uh, even though the abstract of the talk was written in French, because there are non-French speaking people in the room, I will do the talk in English. I hope it's okay for everybody. So the title of the talk is Even Storming, a superhero story. So hint, it will speak about superheroes, of course, but it will also speak about even storming. At the beginning was the verb at the past tense. I don't quote the Bible very often, but this is the even storming Bible. You will learn everything about events, domain events, and how to build uh, a mapping of uh, complex domains through event storming. I'm Cédric Pontet, I'm the CTO of Agile Partner, a company where we do software development and also agile coaching. So I hold two, two, two hats. Uh, I'm a software architect, uh, cloud architect, and also an agile coach. I also co-founded uh, Play14, which is a playful event. Uh, we are all around the world now, and uh, we spend basically two and a half days playing uh, with uh, a lot of things. Uh, you, we use play as a metaphor for learning, basically. And I am also an event stormer. Uh, you see the guy in the middle of the picture with a beard. His name is Alberto Brandolini. He's one of the thought leaders of uh, domain-driven design. And uh, he's created this thing called event storming to try to improve the way we bring domain-driven design in companies. But now event storming has become bigger than that, and you can really use it for many, many different cases. And uh, we'll speak about that uh, during that talk. So what is event storming? Event storming is a workshop format. It's a discovery tool. It's, for and foremost, a communication tool, alignment tool, and it's a massive learning opportunity. How does it work? We'll describe that in a moment. Basically, if you have a complex domain, a big complex business domain, I'm pretty sure that all of you work in, in these kind of domains, like, for example, banking, insurance, uh, industry, whatever is your, your, your job, there might, must be probably a complex domain that you need to explore, you need to understand. There are a lot of rules and a lot of things that are unclear. So we can represent that through a series of events organized on the timeline. That's the basic idea of event storming. But of course, there's also the name of storming, which means that there will be some communication collaboration going on. Along the way, Alberto realized that there were basically three levels uh, of uh, abstraction that you could uh, even storm. The big picture to understand uh, a big mess, basically. Uh, process modeling, if you have a business process, you can model it through even storming. And software design, you can go down uh, and really drill through and uh, go until you reach a point where your domain events and all the uh, artifacts will be transformed into code if you code in domain-driven design way of, uh, and uh, probably even sourcing as well. But you don't really need to do that to use event storming. Event storming is actually uh, a workshop. So even though you don't do DDD and you don't really do uh, event sourcing, you can still use uh, event storming. The idea is instead of using structural modeling, uh, which is basically what we do in most cases, saving classes into tables, uh, solving, saving things at the current state. In this uh, case, we use temporal modeling. We are more interested into what's going on, what changes, and what are the interactions between different actors. That's why we use uh, mainly uh, something like uh, event storming. But now enough big words. I'm going to tell you a story. So imagine that's you. You are a superhero now, and your superpower is even storming. Your master, Brandoli Nissan, is wise and revered, and he has taught you everything you need to know about even storming. You are mastering this art now. And you always carry around stickers and sharpies. You know how to write on them. You know that you should always write in capital letters. You also have a large paper roll that you uh, carry with you, and you have your tape, and you can even storm anywhere you want. And one day you are called upon by the Avengers, because they have a problem. 
They need your help. They want to create a universal e-commerce system, and when we say universal, it's the scale at the universe, where they can sell everything, their gears, their swag, all this stuff. So imagine Amazon, but universe-wise. Right? This is a tough problem, and even though the Avengers are a great team, they have a lot of uh, uh, responsibilities that are uh, shared by skills and abilities, they also called upon some consultants, well, not really this kind of consultant, but we'll see. The problem is that within the Avengers and this great team, the knowledge is distributed. And it should remind you something about your own context in, co in large companies, for example. So we have Steve Rogers, who is in charge of product strategy. He's kind of the leader, so uh, he has charisma, he has, he's inspiring. Uh, he's in charge of the product strategy because of that. Now we have also Thor, who is in charge of sales and marketing. Um, he's kind of persuasive, uh, and uh, he has a great negotiation skills, so, and also a great address book, like he knows people. That's useful for salespeople. He was assisted uh, for communication and community management by Peter Parker. That guy knows how to take pictures, for example, so it's quite handy when you speak about uh, community management. Natasha Romanoff takes care of customer acquisition and growth hacking. She's, uh, well, she, know how people, she knows how people think and she can get access to any kind of information, so that's quite useful. She's uh, working with uh, Wanda Maximoff, who is a user experience expert. Uh, she's great at reading people, and so she helps for that. Clint Barton, uh, he's taking care of inventory and logistics. He's good at uh, things that move around and targeting them and, and following all these this moving targets at the same time. So he's uh, working with Carol Danvers and, Ch and uh, Stephen Strange for shipping. Creating a portal to ship something at the other side of the universe is no problem for uh, Doctor Strange. And, uh, well, Carol Danvers can, can handle the heavy lifting, so it's useful. Bruce Banner, good with numbers. He's smashing numbers. So he's uh, taking care of finances. And believe me, all the customers pay that, that big deal because they don't want to handle the other guy. So it's quite handy. Tony Stark, of course, is tech savvy, so he's taking care of all the technology and operations part. And he's helped by Nebula, who is uh, taking care of uh, infrastructure and architecture, because she knows uh, how to create self-healing systems and uh, systems that work at scale. And last but not least, Rocket Raccoon is the customer support. He is kind of uh, good at haggling and uh, is not really easily fooled, so he will be taking care of uh, customer support. But the thing is, there are some kind of silos in this kind of organization. They don't always speak to each other very well. They are all taking care of their own responsibilities, but sometimes they are caught up by the day-to-day -day work. And when it comes to creating this universal e-commerce system, they don't really see the big picture. It's a, probably the hardest problem that have, they've had to solve, even harder than killing that guy. But don't worry, this talk is spoiler-free. I will not reveal anything about the last Marvel uh, uh, movies. So, the problem is they are lacking vision, and the pun is intended. It's difficult to make sense of this big thing. There are a lot of things to take care of, and that's why they call upon you. They need to create a platform that is easy to use, and easy to use when it comes to human beings, it's already quite difficult, but when it comes to aliens, it's even harder. They need to uh, also handle uh, something that is kind of ubiquitous, like people, uh, every kind of culture and uh, languages and currencies that are used need to be handled. They also need something that will scale. I mean, if... Uh, you have some kind of uh, sport at the other side of the sport even at the other side of the universe, and they want to buy some gear or whatever. They need to cope with that scale, so it's pretty difficult. Complexity. This is a complex problem. There are a lot of factors. There are a lot of things to pay attention to, 
And that's where the big picture event storming is useful. So you remember your master who tells you that big picture event storming, you, you should use it to make sense of a complex domain and see it as a whole. It will provide you global overview across corporate silos. That's the most important. You will cross the, cross the barriers of, of corporations and it will trigger long overdue conversation. Most people in large corporations, they don't speak to each other anymore. So you arrive at the Avenger facility in your own Quidjet, that's cool, and you spot a room that you empty completely from all tables and chairs. Why? Because you want people to be focused, to be engaged in the meeting, not to sit down lazily and wait, for, for, wait that it happens. They should be really collaborating. And on the left there, you spot this nice wall, empty wall, and you start taping your paper roll on it. The paper roll will be your unlimited modeling space. Why you want this to be a big space? Because you don't want people to limit themselves by physical uh, boundaries. The bigger the, 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 the paper roll is, the bigger they will, uh, or the easier it will get for people to explore and not forget any part of the domain, of the complex domain. And if it gets too small, just add some more. You have other walls in the, wall, so in the room, so you can actually add some more. And then you have your secret weapon. It's there, over, over there, if you want to take a look. You have all your post-its and your markers and uh, all the, the gear that you need to actually run an event storming. And last but not least, you prepare a visible legend. That's very important. It will be incrementally uh, populated along the way, uh, and it's going to be the reference for your, your, your session. You need to invite the right people. If you have uh, uh, different uh, silos in the organization, you should have people from at least one person from each silo, so you can get the big picture. If you don't have that, you might just skip part of the knowledge. It's a very big problem. So your master, Alberto, says, invite the right people. And those right people are people with questions. Usually it's IT people, technical people, uh, architects, uh, change agents, DevOps people, and people with answers. These are decision makers, uh, business experts, domain experts, and uh, business analysts sometimes. These people are, people are already in the organization, but they don't talk to each other. Before you begin, you ask Steve Rogers to uh, give a bit of context. Why are we here today? What do we want to achieve? What's the overall goal in terms of strategy? Not in terms of software, but in terms of, in terms of what will this thing bring to the organization? What do we want to achieve here? And then you remind people that the goal is to see the big picture. So you should not leave anything unturned. You should really go deep into knowledge. And you remind people about some very basic rules. One person, one marker. Important. Everybody should be able to participate. So it's very important that you provide these things for people. One concept per sticky. You don't want to have a, a, a book written down in one single sticky because you want this to be visible. That's why also you recommend people to write in capital letters once more. You need to enforce the timeline. The whole idea is to actually have domain events along a timeline. So this timeline is important. The notion of uh, what happens after what or before what is very important. And of course, you should make all the rules explicit. Then you start with explaining what a domain event actually is. A domain event is something that occurred in time. It's represented by a verb at past tense, and it should be relevant for domain experts. You write down the first domain event. In this case, an item has been added to a cart, so item added to cart is your first domain event. It's the easy one. And you stick it on your modeling space. Around one third of the modeling space is a good idea. Why? Because you want to leave space before, 
so that in case something before should happen, you have space. And you want to give space after, so the, the idea is to really explore. And then you tell people, okay, now you know the rules. Everybody has stickies, everybody has markers. Orange stickies, by the way, it's very important, color coding. And then everybody should start writing down some events. So we start with item removed from cart. That's the parallel of the other. And then we have shopping cart was checked out. And then the delivery address was provided. But then, OK, wait. We are missing something here. We are missing some the, to speak about the money. And you remember your master tell you money is something you should really look at. Basically, most companies want to make money, right? So follow the money. It will trigger interesting discussions. So you start with the group. You start to explore the money thing. So payment method was provided. Delivery price was calculated. Total price was updated. And the card price was calculated before that. And the card checked out was requested. And then you can reprioritize. You've seen that you need to move post-its around. That's the cool thing with post-its, that you can move them around. So you can really enforce your timeline by really reprioritizing things in time. And there you go. Yet another conversation uh, emerged from, from this, uh, this uh, workshop. We always tend to follow the happy path, because we are built like that. We are optimistic most of the time. So. We also need to explore what, when things go wrong, go wrong. So the card can be reset. And the payment method could be invalid, wrong credit card or something. So it's important to follow that. And then some questions arise. Yeah, what about discounts and vouchers and things like that? Do we want to do that now? Uh, it's going to be very complex. We don't really have a strategy for that. Mm, maybe we can... Uh, it would be interested business-wise, but maybe we want to leave that for later on. And then a new notation appears. It's called hotspot. And you will track all the questions, all the things that you, the decisions that you probably want to delay because you don't have the ability to answer that question right now. You should track that on a hotspot. So you put it on the board and you update your uh, living uh, legend with a hotspot. So a hotspot is a pain point, a bottleneck, a question that will need answer because you probably don't have the right people in the room to answer that right now. Something to clarify later. And then you go back to your events, and the last event from that sequence is order is placed. But what happens after that? Well, you should validate your address. You need to know where to send the products. And of course, because we take care of the not-so-happy pass, we also have sometimes addresses that are invalid. But wait, how do you know your address is valid? You need some kind of thing that you can call to uh, validate your address. And luckily, Dr. Strange knows the My Universe repository. It's a global address repository where you can really check that the address is valid. Cool. So you will actually call that. And that's yet another notation. It's called an external system. So the My Universe Universal Address System. And you increment your notation. A system, an external system is a system that is maintained by either another team in the organization or another organization. So it's out of your control, basically. You will need to interact with that system, to integrate with that, with that system somehow. And you go on, so your, after your order is, uh, is uh, placed and your address is validated, you will have uh, the order that is priced, including the taxes. Then you need a payment method. Again, another external system. You probably don't want to implement your payment system yourself. So you have the payment taken care of, but now how do we know that the products are actually available? Do we need to take care of that? What happens if the product is, is, has been ordered and paid for and it's not available? 
well, we need to ask the user what he wants to do, if uh, he wants to have the product shipped later, or if they want to actually be refunded from the product, for the product. So you will have to in ask your uh, inventory uh, system about that. So your product is either reserved or it's not available. And it's a legacy problem, so you don't have a clean, nice REST API to uh, call that system. You will need to integrate with that. This is another topic. Don't lose too much time speaking about that. The idea is that the, the, this conversation flow. So you need to uh, write down a hotspot and leave this problem for later on. This is the whole idea of hotspot. Not get stuck in a long conversation that will basically not provide any answers. So you will need to work that around that. And that's it. And then we continue. So you need to notify your user. Then the user has to take a decision. Do I want the product to be refunded or do I want the product to be shipped later? And you introduce the notion of customer. It's an actor in your system. So you increment your notation. A user or an actor is someone who interacts with the system and takes decisions. And this is very important. And you continue, so you need to request the product to be shipped later if the decision was to ship later, or to refund the product, and so forth and so on. And then this is scheduled. And you need to, after that, prepare the order. You need to pack it, you need to uh, update the inventory system, and you need to declare that the order has been prepared so that it can be shipped. And for the shipping, you want to also track the, the product. You need to be able to tell your, your customers where the product is, uh, or the products are, and uh, if everything is fine. You need to alert them, so send them notifications. And in the end, the order should be received. And that's the end of your flow. Except you forgot about accounting. This is something that is useful in most companies. It's a pain in the ass usually, but you need to update that. So you uh, will uh, also track everything in the accounting system. So transaction accounted for, invoice prepared, uh, invoice was, uh, the document was generated by the, uh, the document system, and then it's sent to the user, or the customer in that case. But wait, what happens if the order is canceled? Well, usually people want to be refunded. So you will have to take care of all these compensation actions that will need to take uh, to happen so that everything is uh, reversed. So the order is refunded. That means that the accounting is uh, updated. You have some uh, counter uh, uh, thing to, to do. Your product, product uh, is uh, expected to be returned. And then the product is returned, and the order is finally cancelled off. Uh, the, the process is finished. So at that moment, it's basically a good time to make a break. And after the break, you use storytelling to check if everything is right and that you haven't forgotten uh, important things. So you can actually use uh, storytelling to tell different business narratives. In that case, you have two main narratives. The order is successful, the order is cancelled. There might be some more, of course, it's just an example. So I, I, I don't want to, you to, uh, to really... The, this domain is uh, much more complicated than that, but I don't want to spend too much time exploring the domain. The idea is to explain what uh, event storming is. Once you have your domain mapped out, you can actually group domain events into subdomain boundaries. You see some groups, clusters of events uh, emerging, and you can regroup them. The whole idea of subdomains is that they can be then uh, represented in domain-driven design by bounded contexts. A bounded context is basically something that uh, creates a coherent, uh, encapsulated whole of different uh, concepts that belong together. So, it helps you resonate about your big system into smaller parts. And usually a subdomain and a bounded context that is encapsulating a subdomain it has one single responsibility. And you can have 
these nice events, higher level events, uh, with a higher level of abstraction that flow between these bounded contexts to synchronize them. So in our case, you have the shopping uh, subdomain, you have the payment subdomain, you have the accounting, the shipping, the tracking. And all these subdomains, they probably need to either be coded by your team or you need to integrate with an external system and, and wrap this integration nicely. So, big picture event storming, rich, rich discussions and interactions. Everyone should be engaged. You have the right people in the room, you can go up to 20, 25 people. If you have a room big enough, it should be very rich. A lot of different people could work at different uh, spots on the map because they know that part better, then they will focus on that part. And uh, the different point of views are important to explore because most of the time, not one single person has the whole truth. Most of the time, they see part of the same problem in different angles. So it's important to trigger these conversations. You should always be focused on the business. And you start building a shared language. That's very important in terms of domain-driven design, this, no this notion of ubiquitous language. Uh, the language is ubiquitous in, in a given context, of course, but still it's a ubiquitous language for the company, for the organization. You start explaining a bit better what a customer is, what, what uh, an order is, and these kind of, of business notions that you're using. Also, it helps visualizing things. We human beings like visualization. It helps us resonate about things. You have this incremental net notation, so you always start with the domain events, the most important things, because it helps you really build the timeline. And it's normal that it's fuzzy. It's fuzzy by design. It should be a big mess, according to Alberto, because out of this chaos, uh, some nice things will emerge. And it's good that these conversations are taking uh, place. Most of the time, it's a very bad thing that people try to hide uh, under the, the, the mat. So good thing that conversation happened. And you are exploring together. You are building a shared vision. And you keep uncertainty in check, especially using hotspots. You should always track things. If a conversation is happening and it's going nowhere because you can't take that decision, write that down on a hotspot and leave it for later and try to find the people who can help you solve that problem. So the whole idea is to reach clarity about your big picture. So time goes on and at some point Rocket just says, hey guys, uh, you put me in charge of customer support but I have no idea what the process for uh, product return uh, should look like. So you need to map that as well. So you will go a bit deeper and not using the big picture anymore because you have different levels of abstraction that you can map, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. So here, process modeling, even storming, can be used to, mac to map an epic or a set of features. In that case, it would be the product return. And you alter a bit the way you, you represent your, your modeling surface by, by having some preconditions, outcomes, and the flow to discover is in the middle. So the end goal is to have a product that is returned. So you have a domain events, product returned. And then you have something that is the request. A customer has requested a product return. So it's a new notation. It's called a command. It's a, an order that is given by the user, a decision that is taken by the user, and uh, uh, it will be handled uh, by the software. It could be also that a, trigger, uh, a command is triggered by the system itself. Sending one part of the system would send a command to another part of the system. It's always written down on a post-it with an imper imperative verb. It's an order. It's, it's, a, it's a something that you instruct the system to do. And who gives that, or who takes that decision? The customer, of course. But he needs some information to take that decision. He probably needs order details, the product description, and the product price. 
it's that product that he wants to return, not the other one that, that was part of that order. So he needs that information to take that decision. This, this, is, called, uh, this is called the read model. Basically, it's something that is a decision-making tool. It's not only d data, it's something that provides consolidated, consolidated information in order to take a decision, and it's displayed to the user or to the actor that needs to take that decision. And then you have the Avenger customer service system that will uh, generate a domain event called uh, product return requested. This will need to be handled by something, and this something is called a policy, something that will react to an event. So far, so, so far we have a command and domain event, and we can have a command that is sent to an external system and generates a domain event. But we have also policies. Policies will react to a given uh, event. The idea is whenever event, then command. Okay? So it gives you the ability, as your master explained to you, to have this nice flow of, uh, of uh, things. So you have a read model that is uh, uh, basically uh, making an actor aware of things. This actor takes a decision that basically leads to a command that is sent to an external system the external system will generate a domain event. The domain event will be handled by a policy that will react to that event. The policy is either automated or maybe a, a user, another actor, should take a decision on that and act on this policy. And it triggers another command that will then be sent to another external system and so forth and so on. So you can change things like that. It's a color puzzle. So in that case, maybe uh, the... Um, customer service agent will need to take the decision, do we allow the product return or not? If uh, some person just order on your platform and they keep on uh, returning products, you might want to uh, tell them, hey guys, uh, maybe you should order less and be, be sure about uh, what you're ordering. Or if someone has ordered, just returned a product like six months ago, it's perfectly fine if they return a product now. So this decision needs to be taken. And then it will lead to another policy that will take care of, the, of uh, tracking the product return and compensating the action uh, the, for the, the accounting system and so forth and so on. Then the tracking uh, policy will take care of uh, in updating the legacy system, the, the inventory system. And in the end, we will go back to the uh, customer service system to say everything is okay now, the product has been returned, everything is fine. So you are modeling a process now, not the big picture anymore. You, you go a bit deeper, and, and it's a more granular thing that you want to model. Um, this is the part where people start uh, forgetting things or lying, because it's more like we are in charge of that uh, process. And most of the time, they don't really want to show things to sometimes the management or whatever. So you need to really pay attention to that, that nobody is... Uh, hiding some information. Because ambiguity does not compile. That's what Alberto says. You need to be clear about things. You need to make everything as explicit as possible. And you need to challenge the value. You need to um, really try to um, take the chance to also discover inconsistencies and, and maybe new opportunities. Because Having this discussion happening during that, that modeling, uh, it gives you maybe the opportunity to offer new ways of doing things, new services, new uh, uh, business advantage that, that you, you can take. The overall idea is to reach agreement between people and so consensus. So even later, Again, Rocket Raccoon comes to you and says, this manual policy is really a pain in his ass. Because it's manual. And of course, it's a lot of work. So at that point, you probably want to maybe try to automate that. And there are some rules that you should uh, make explicit. What can you automate? What can you not automate? 
because your system is uh, a bit clearer at, for now since thanks to the big picture and the process modeling thing you are a bit deeper now and you can really represent things as software artifacts that's where software design uh, event storming comes to place so the whole idea here is to uh, have a set of software artifacts that are represented by these uh, color post-it and that will uh, be in charge of uh, enforcing the domain logic and the business consistency. These things are called aggregate. This is really something that you will code, like it will be transformed into uh, classes in uh, object-oriented programming or functions in the functional programming and it will be in charge of what? Of really making sure that this, um, um, bis this business logic is well represented. But it's usually when business people, uh, when they participate to this kind of session, they are getting a bit scared because the word aggregate, which comes, basic, by the way, from the domain-driven design uh, uh, field, it, it scares people for some reason. But it's not so complicated to understand, actually. So an aggregate, it's an yet a new notation, it's basically a state machine logic. It's something with a life cycle. Take an order, for example, an order has a beginning and an end, and in between different states that it needs to go through to be, uh, to be processed. So we focus on behavior here, not on data. That's the, whole, the, the idea of uh, oriented, object-oriented programming, basically, that you always should focus on behavior. And the aggregate enforces business consistency. All the business rules should be enforced by that aggregate. So the software design uh, with aggregate is something that is difficult. Uh, it really needs to be uh, done by some people who know how to design software, but also people who have the knowledge about the business, because there are some rules to, expl to uh, make explicit. So just imagine that you have a request for a product return. That is a command. This command is handled by this aggregate called product return request. And it will trigger something called product return requested. It's an event. This event will be reacted to by a policy called product return policy that will ask or give a, uh, send a command to say, OK, we need to authorize that product return. Remember that the, the, the idea is to automate this, uh, this process. It will, this command will be handled by something, another aggregate called customer history. And this aggregate can take decision because it's his, it's his responsibility, its responsibility to take these decisions because it implements the business logic. So the product could be authorized, the product return could be authorized, it will be an event that will be reacted to by yet, again, this product return policy, send a command, accept product return to the product return request. That will generate another event, product return refund accepted. And then the policy will again uh, react and say, OK, refund product. And then it will send, be sent this, this uh, command will be sent to your uh, payment system to refund the, the product. That's the easy, uh, nice, happy pass. But then you can have the pass where the refund is not authorized. So the policy will send a command saying, OK, refuse product return. The aggregate will say, product refund was refused. And then you have the case, and basically if, the, if it's refused, nothing else happens. And then you have the case where the manual approval is required. So the policy will send a command saying, OK, submit product return to approval. The aggregate will, trigger, will generate an event that is product re uh, refund submitted to approval. And at that point, you need your uh, uh, agent from your customer support to do something. So you need this list of product written previously uh, to take the decision if you accept or not the return. The, and in that case, yeah, the, the, the actor will decide accept or not. 
So you see that you have this kind of state machine that takes place. And this is basically what you uh, will encapsulate into the customer service bounded context. The whole idea is to actually, this is what we call the policy is actually what uh, is called also a process manager. It's a pattern, a uh, messaging pattern. And the idea is to have aggregates that will send even, that will be reacted to by a process manager that will really not take care of the business logic per se, but more the or orchestration of the different uh, parts that take decision. So this process manager just say, if this, then that. If event, then command. And you can really reorchestrate things by just changing that piece of uh, process manager uh, that is the just orchestrating. If you change the process manager, you don't need to change anything about the aggregates. The aggregates which enforce the business uh, rules, they will stay the same, but the orchestration might, might change. So it's a very flexible way to design software. Again, you reach this knowledge through uh, software design event storming. It's a good time when you do this to rewrite your domain events, because this will be code. And if you say that you have uh, an event that is named that, and you put that in production, changing that name afterwards will be a pain. It will be really painful. So you need to pay attention to that. So Alberto says use pedantic semantic precision. Really try to make the decision, the final decision, how do we call that domain event? How do we call, call this thing? You've seen that you had symmetries. Usually what you have in a system like that is you have a command that is generating a, an event, and this symmetry is very important. The same kind of, of, uh, of uh, command event pattern happens all the time. But sometimes it does not, and it's also important to, to, to track that. Again, challenging things is a good idea. You, there is not one single domain model that you can uh, create. Sometimes a domain model makes sense at the beginning of your project, and it, maybe you learn a bit more in, in, uh, in the process, and at some point you want to change that model. You probably want to throw the other model, the previous model, away and, and create a new one. The good thing about domain events is it gives you the ability to do these kind of changes without breaking everything, because everything is really nicely encapsulated into uh, pieces of software that have a single responsibility. So throwing the wrong things away is a good thing. But for that, you need to make sure that you don't fall in lo your love with your intuitions. So challenge yourself and try to think outside the box. Hard problems don't have obvious solutions. And the best thing you can do when you do a software design event storming is to have a product owner, to ask questions. To, because these people, they know uh, the business, and you need them. Even though it's a more technical event storming, you need the business knowledge. The overall idea is consistency. So, word of advice, if you are uh, an event stormer and you want to run these uh, sessions and you want to improve your superpowers and put them on steroids, come prepared. You should know your context. You should know what you're trying to uh, achieve as, a, as a, um, a facilitator before you start the, the session. Clarify the objective with the sponsor or the business owner uh, in the, before the event, before the, the, the workshop and maybe ask them to give a con some context, as I said. You can start with an icebreaker, with a fun activity. I mentioned I was one of the founders of Play14. We do a lot of uh, icebreaking games, things like that, just to, so that people just get rid of their day-to-day uh, -day thing and start to be in more collaborative uh, mindset. Don't push your own assumptions. As a facilitator, your role is not to uh, be a consultant. It's a, to be a facilitator. So you should not tell people, your business is like that. They know their, their business. They are the ones who are coming up with uh, the rules and these things. It's not your job. Your job is to make that emerge. And the best way to make that emerge is to ask a lot of questions. 
And where you, when you're done with asking questions, ask more questions. Again and again. By the way, there are a lot of tools that you can use uh, that teach you how to, uh, to ask questions that are uh, clean questions, not, not pushing your assumptions in your questions. And so you should always work in improving your facilitation skills. I'm preparing another talk on that subject, and at some point maybe I will do it here. Uh, you never know. Uh, and you can actually also mix event storming with other tools like story mapping, uh, impact mapping, uh, whatever other tools that you've used in the past, you can really mix them together. And it's a very, very good thing. There are a lot of different flavors. You could map uh, with event storming as is, system, or to be. Or you could use it for exploration. That's the first intent. But you could also use it for explanation. You have a newcomer in your team. You want them to uh, understand the, 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 the big picture, the process, what you do as a company. Just do an event storming with, the, with that person. And they will get this vision uh, in, in like two hours, you can map the whole thing. It's a very good way to explain things because it's very visual. Single flow event storming from Madame Dimitruk is uh, something that uh, exists. Uh, I will not go into details like that. Basically, the idea of, uh, of Alberto is that uh, event storming is his pizza. You can put your topping on it as much as you want. And there is uh, an event storming recipe book that is coming. Uh, soon, I will be writing probably in this book the, my personal recipe, which is uh, using uh, event storming for gather, to gather feedback. This is uh, what we've did, done at Play 14, and I reused the, the format with different uh, meaning. Like we had the events, what happened during the the the, um, the conference or the end conference. Uh, the pink ones were what the fuck moment, what's just happened. Uh, the green ones were takeaways, and the yellow ones were uh, improvements that we could make. And it gives you a lot of information. You could even use that to remap the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe. You could try that. That's a fun activity. If you want to learn more, you have the official website, you have a LinPub book that is not finished. Uh, don't ask Alberto, but that is it making him a bit angry. Uh, you have a GitHub repository uh, from uh, Marius Gill, who is one of the event stormers, and you have the blogs and stuff like that. Thank you very much. We have two minutes for questions. Uh, <laughs> I ex expected that question. So um, what Alberto says is that the, the end result is actually not the overall goal of even storming. It's the discussions that are happening. So usually what you can do is uh, to take this uh, large piece of paper and, and just stick it somewhere. Uh, if you really want to, you can, uh, you can use uh, like online whiteboards and stuff like that to document. Um, the... It's probably something that you, you should be able to do again in, in a, a much uh, smaller time if you want to do it again. So, and actually redoing and even storming on the same subject gives you more insight. So the, 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 result, the end result is not really the, the post-its themselves. It's the conversation that takes place. But yeah, documenting is a pain in the ass. Most of the time it's taking pictures and storing them in some kind of wiki. That's good enough sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's basically a brainstorming approach, but there is a structure of it. Like the domain event first gives you a bit of structure, then you add the, the hotspots to avoid long conversations that are quite sterile and, and doesn't, don't really provide any value. Then you have this uh, notion of command and all this kind of stuff. So it gives you a bit of structure in your brainstorming. But the term storming comes actually from game storming which is a book that uh, Alberto read, and, and he decided to use these post-it things uh, to, to try to give a bit of uh, structure, still freedom. Yeah. 30 seconds. One more question. Yep.
Yep. So if you know the domain already, uh, you might push your own uh, insights to, uh, to other people. So it, you need to be careful of that. Sometimes not knowing the domain is actually more useful and just focusing on facilitation. Because the, dom the domain knowledge is already there. People have, have it. The problem is they have part of it and they don't share it with each other. You can observe observe behavior during the during the session, and you will see that if people people get disengaged, for example, uh, if they start really like getting angry and this kind of stuff, that's your role as a facilitator to handle that and maybe jump in and say, okay, let's cool down, let's make a break, come back to it afterwards, and and try to figure this out. So it's really facilitation skills. Okay, I think we are done. Thank you very much.